Genetic engineering has the potential to change the human species forever. Genetic technology will soon allow parents to design their babies in the hope of creating the perfect child. But how much is too much? We'll talk with a bioethicist about engineering our children and knowing when to stop. Let's take note with Dr. Rosemary Tong, a distinguished professor in healthcare ethics at the Center for Professional and Applied Ethics at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Give us a little background on eugenics or bio or genetic engineering. When did this all become a possibility? Well, there's a really important distinction to make between eugenics on the one hand and I suppose genomics or whatever you want to call it on the other hand, eugenics has sort of a tortured and sad past, especially in our country uh, in the late 18th century and the early 20th century um, and 19th century also, of course. Uh, it was a, based on some very, very bad science um, about what characteristics could be inherited. For example, some people believed that promiscuity could be inherited, among other things. Um, it was also involved or it intersected uh, with several um, unfortunate attempts by initially well-meaning people to better or improve the human race. And there was a lot of money behind this, especially in the late uh, part of the 19th, of the 18th century and the late 1800s. And a lot of uh, wealthy industrialists were also eugenicists. They wanted to improve uh, the stock here, particularly the northern European stock and so on, um, and make sure people were more physically fit and mentally alert and socially productive and all of those good things. Uh, however, they decided that one way of doing it would be to have some very, very strict regulations and laws ab about who could procreate and who couldn't. Um, and that brought in some very repressive laws related to sterilization that were targeted at the so-called feeble-minded. In some instances, um, the feeble-minded, particularly women, uh, were uh, borderline IQ, I suppose, in one way or the other. But a lot of times they were simply illiterate uh, or poor or uh, not well educated uh, as along those lines. And yet there were many, many forced coercive sterilizations here in the U.S. basically to prevent uh, these women from procreating. And then that all intersected with the wave of um, immigration laws that were targeted towards people that were thought to be um, diminishing in some way uh, the stock here in the U.S., and initially targeted towards people from Southern Europe, um, Italy, Greece, uh, countries such as that, later targeted against Asian immigrants and so on, as people who some way their blood would weaken the stock over here. It's a very, very sad and tragic um, history in our country. And how has it evolved? Uh, well, I think currently what we're seeing now in the new genomics has the advantage of being based on uh, what is much better science. There's no way to deny that the discovery of DNA and everything that ha that has brought is very sophisticated, very good science. Now we sort of have, uh, instead of many of these opportunities for genetic interventions being or reproductive interventions being coerced in, in a certain sort of way, people wanting them and kind of begging for them and saying, please, let me have some of that too. Uh, and fortunately, um, and I'm crossing my fingers that this continues to be the case, um, this type of science and so on is not intersecting with these immigration laws or anything like that. To, to what extent can parents today influence or shape their offspring genetically with the technology that exists today? Well, there are certain ways, but they're pretty rigorous and pretty costly. Uh, for example, if you were in a in vitro fertilization clinic, uh, you could, while you're uh, 
future child is still in the petri dish, have it screened for a limited number of serious genetic uh, diseases and disorders and so on, and at that moment make a decision uh, not to implant any one of the tiny little embryos that had a quote-unquote negative characteristic. So you could control right there in, uh, I should say, before the moment of implantation back in the womb. Uh, but that's if you're in an infertility clinic, you, you're at the right infertility clinic with the right kind of specialist, and you have quite a bit of money at hand. Otherwise, you're basically going to use uh, one of the screening methods that occurs prenatally, usually amniocentesis or chorionic villi sampling, uh, to do the same um, during pregnancy and discover, for example, uh, whether your embryo or fetus has a serious genetic disorder. How off are non-disease interventions, for instance, parents uh, would like their offspring to have athletic ability or a certain uh, height or hair color, for example. I think that's pretty far off uh, from what I've read, from what I've heard, uh, and, and certainly from what I think. Uh, the complexity of making those kinds of interventions and the number of genes that would probably be involved in controlling for a of the likelihood of be having a certain color eyes and so on and so forth is pretty far down the road. What, what are some of the moral issues that all of this new capability present to us? Well, I think it's some moral issues uh, that are the most serious ones are about our desire to control our destiny in one way or another and in this instance to control our reproductive destiny and how our children are going to be physically, mentally, perhaps even morally. Uh, parents are ready have a tendency to try to shape their children environmentally in a variety of ways. Uh, some of them uh, fairly uh, overbearing, others of them excellent and so on. We're going to see the same thing uh, in this notion of genetic intervention and so on. So this desire to control, uh, people are feeling, oh wow, yet another opportunity to get in and to know what's going to happen before uh, it happens. And in fact, some people are afraid that if this uh, technology proceeds as many think it may, think it may proceed, that we may be creating two classes, the genetic uh, aristocracy and the genetic underclass, for example. Well, it, it could get, uh, you know, whether it would ever get that far, I, I wouldn't know. But certainly, uh, many things you see in science fi, sci-fi flicks, um, such as Gattaca, when I saw that film, it has a genetic aristocracy and a genetic underclass. The first time I thought, oh, this is far-fetched. Now I'm beginning to think, well, given that it's going to be the more rich and privileged people, more knowledgeable people that are going to have access to the more dramatic of these interventions, now those people will be able to add to the repertoire of things to provide to their children. Yet another thing, a genetic uh, uh, Head Start program, right. a genetic Head Start program, whereas people who don't have access to even basic minimum health care, all too many people in our society, well, I very much doubt that a package of designer genes is going to be included in whatever kind of health care they are you know, get to scrap together. But the reality is, is that genes are only a predisposition for a certain characteristic. Just because you introduce it doesn't mean that it will uh, produce the, the, uh, the desired result. And in fact, apparently, the gene can do, has, has multiple uh, distinctions, and it can do one of two or three different things. Absolutely. I think a whole lot of people are in for a whole lot of disappointment that in basically selecting uh, certain possibilities for their future children or whatever, uh, when that happens and should it happen or whatever, will discover that uh, depending on the environment, the kind of home that they place that child, these qualities or whatever 
will manifest themselves or not. And what's more, given the complexity, they'll, they might discover that although they got their tall child, inadvertently, uh, that child might be deficient uh, in any number of ways that intersected with that increase in height. So there will be, I think, uh, quite a bit of disappointment. There are a number of scientists around the world who are, who are working on uh, these germline uh, projects and on, on cloning, in fact. How successful, by and large, are they? What's the success rate? Well, the success rate, if we take uh, the animal success rate and good old Dolly, uh, the number of tries that were made before Dolly succeeded, and supposedly Dolly hasn't succeeded so well because she's aging prematurely uh, due to the way she was cloned. Uh, if that's indicative of what's, you know, the harm factor involved, I wouldn't start uh, to try to do any of this tomorrow on a human population. How far from it. Uh -huh. And in fact, some of the characteristics that parents might be interested in in enhancing in their their own child, we don't even know where they are. For example, appearance and athletic ability. This is different from uh, determining whether someone is predisposed for cancer or a certain oh, disease. A absolutely. And actually, when you phrase the question that way, it made me think, well, maybe we haven't progressed that much from the 19th century after all. And uh, given that people thought promiscuity was inheritable uh, in some very simplistic way, I fear that some of our population might think that you know, looking like a certain person or acting like a certain person is inheritable in the same easy sort of way. It's far more complex than that. In fact, you say, eat of the fruits of biotechnology, we should, but not so much that we grow into something that we can no longer recognize as human and to which we can no longer relate. We're not that far along no, in, in a lot of ways, but will not. we know when to stop? And what words of caution would you have to those who are embarking on these uh, research projects? I think that the, these projects should be pursued at a reasonable rate. I just hope that our society, which isn't known for its ability to set upper limits, we're quite good at setting lower limits, but we're very bad at setting upper limits, a point beyond which we should go. I think we need to learn an ethics of restraint that requires good judgment. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think there's a gene for good judgment. Uh, and if only there were, I think uh, we'd all be better off. On that note, we're out of time. Thanks so much for being Thank with you. us. Our guest has been Rosemary Tong, who's with the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. For Take Note, I'm Patty Satalia. A copy of the program you've just seen can be purchased through Penn State Media Sales at mediasales.psu.edu or by calling 800-770-2111.